we want to solve a problem, we first have to figure out what's causing it, especially if we're talking about a problem that's happening over and over again. Just like if we wanted to fix a leaky dam, we'd have to find the leaks first. We are in the midst of the worst opioid epidemic in U.S. history. And this opioid epidemic is first and foremost an epidemic of overprescribing. Prior to 1980, doctors were very reluctant to prescribe opioids for their patients because they were worried about addiction. By 1990, or the late 1990s, doctors were dispensing opioids like vending machines to anybody that came in and said, I have pain. Today, doctors prescribe more than 230 million prescriptions annually. And just to put that in perspective, the United States consumes over 80% of the world's supply of opioid pain pills, despite constituting less than 5% of the world's population. So the question is, how did healers, how did healers become dealers, <laughs> right? And I'm sure you've heard about the role that big pharma's played in this, in this public health crisis that we're facing. And I'm sure you've heard about pill mill doctors. These are willfully nefarious doctors exchanging prescriptions for cash. And they, both of those elements have played a huge role, right? Big pharma really is to blame, and there are really greedy doctors out there. But the truth is that big pharma existed well before this public health crisis. And frankly, the term quack dates back to the 17th century. So the question is, why this drug and why now? To really be able to understand this problem, we have to recognize that this current opioid epidemic is a symptom of a faltering healthcare system and a culture that has demonized pain. And it's perpetrated not by a small subset of pill mill doctors, but by doctors like me, compassionate doctors meaning to do well, caught in a system gone awry, harming patients who are showing up who really want help. So in order to understand what caused this epidemic, we need to be aware of three invisible forces inside of the healthcare system that are driving this problem. The first force is the industrialization of medicine, or what I call the Toyotaization of medicine, right? Over the last three decades, there has been a huge migration of physicians outside of private practice and physician-led practices into large, integrated healthcare systems. We are now salaried employees of healthcare factories. And what this means is we practice assembly line medicine. The throughput of body parts is more important than whole patient health. There's tremendous pressure on doctors to palliate pain, prescribe pills and perform procedures because that's what pays, and to please patients because patients have become customers. Guess what? Opioids are a pretty good solution to that problem. We have primary care doctors who have to see more than 40 patients a day, less than five minutes per patient. A couple of years ago, my then 11-year-old son Googled my name on the internet, and he came up with one of these internet doctor rating sites. And he called me over, he said, Mom, is this you? And there I was, I only had one rating on this site, one out of four stars. And there was a comment about me, and the comment said, seeing this doctor made me wish I had never sought help in the first place. Wrong diagnosis, wrong medication, seek help from someone else. I very sheepishly had to admit to my son that that was me, and I was filled with shame. I go around the country and have done so for years now, encouraging doctors to prescribe fewer opioids. And what they say to me is, I'll prescribe fewer opioids when you can promise me that my patients will still give me a good rating on the satisfaction survey. Right? So this is what we're dealing with right now. Now, the good news is my son came up to me about 10 minutes later and said, Mom, don't worry. I gave you four out of four stars. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> okay, the second big invisible force driving this opioid epidemic is the medicalization of poverty. Over the last three decades, doctors have increasingly been faced with having to cope with not just the biological illnesses that are afflicting their patients, but also their socioeconomic and psychosocial distress. And yet they haven't been given the tools or the resources to handle those problems. So what do they do? They have to biologize problems that aren't really biological, shoehorn them into our diagnostic codes in order to get insurance companies to pay for it. And in the face of those overwhelming problems, unemployment, multi-generational trauma, uh, homelessness, right? 
doctors are left feeling not only overwhelmed, but feeling like, well, what can I do? At least I can prescribe this pill, right? At least for the short term, my patient will feel better. And indeed, patients do go home and take the pill, the opioid, and describe feeling like they're being held or covered by a warm blanket. They come back later and say, thank you, doctor, you really helped me. And the doctor gets to experience gratitude, right, why they went into medicine in the first place. And yet this really is a false god. So not only are doctors incentivized to prescribe pills in order to take care of non-biological problems, we now have patients who are incentivized to adopt the patient role in order to pay the bills. We have over 13 million people in this country on disability. The number two reasons for disability are chronic pain and mental health. In the 1950s, we had less than a million people in this country in, on disability, and the number two reasons were heart disease and cancer. Why is that? It's not because we're getting sicker. It's because patients have figured out, or people have figured out, that by adopting the sick role and signing up for disability, they can pay their bills. And yet, in order to validate their sick role status, they have to participate in the healthcare system, which also means taking certain types of pills. Karl Marx said, religion is the opium of the masses. We are at a point in our history where opium has become the religion of the masses. The third invisible force driving the opioid epidemic, illness narratives, in particular, narratives about pain. Today, we believe in the healthcare system that pain is dangerous. So not only is pain painful in the moment, but if we experience pain, we are setting ourselves up for pain in the future. How does that work? Because pain in the moment can leave a neurological scar, which centralizes pain and makes us vulnerable to more pain in the form of a chronic pain condition. This is a very modern concept. And it's essentially borrowed from the mental health field, right? This idea that if we experience psychological pain, we might develop post-traumatic stress disorder in the future, all sort of stemming from Freud's original conception that what happens to us in childhood sets us up for neuroses as adults. But 150 years ago, doctors didn't think this way about pain. They, in fact, thought that pain was salutary, that pain could boost the immune response, that it could boost your cardiovascular system, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And in fact, now we're finding that People who take opioids heal more slowly than people who don't. People who get surgery with minimal opioids heal faster than people who receive a lot of opioids doing stirring surgery. These three invisible forces are what is driving this opioid epidemic. So the real question is, how can we do better? How can we fix this problem? Number one, the Toyotaization of medicine. Assembly line care works great for some medical problems, a knee replacement. Uh, a heart attack, a cataract surgery. But it's terrible for chronic relapsing and remitting illnesses like chronic pain and like addiction. So what's the solution? We need to build an infrastructure inside the House of Medicine that can take care of chronic illnesses. And we have to reprioritize the doctor-patient relationship. We have to incentivize, incentivize doctors to spend time with their patients to discuss these complex issues. We need there to be a relationship through time so that opioids don't have to be a proxy for a doctor-patient relationship. That means we have to build an infrastructure inside medicine to provide care to patients for chronic pain that doesn't just involve opioids, right? We need to build an infrastructure to take care of addiction and embrace it as a disease and insist that insurance companies pay to treat it. The medicalization of poverty. How do we fix that problem? If we have decided as a society that medicine is our social safety net, then we need to give doctors the resources to take care of the problems that patients really have and not biologize problems that aren't really biological. How about narratives? Can we bring back some of the narratives from 150 years ago? Is it time to do that? How about people are resilient? How about the body can heal itself? How about pain is inevitable? And there may even be some times when some sorts of pain can serve a useful purpose in our lives, if only to remind us what joy looks like. And possibly most importantly, 
that doctors are limited in what they can fix once it's broken. The future of healthcare depends upon closing this gap between increasingly industrialized, medicalized healthcare care delivery and the growing psychosocial, psychospiritual needs of our patients. Thank you. <laughs>